So good afternoon and thank you so much for coming on this glorious, bright and sunny day, one which we haven't seen for a while. My name is Jessica Folter and I'm an associate professor in the School of Health Studies and graduate chair in the Department of Women's Studies and Feminist Research. And I'm extremely pleased to introduce Arthur Frank, our inaugural speaker for Narrative Rounds. As part of a broader proposal for enhancing interdisciplinary activities on health humanities and narrative medicine at Western, these narrative rounds are intended to provide a space for stimulating dialogue and critical reflection about health-related topics and issues among scholars, health practitioners, and others whose work lies at the intersection of narrative and health and medicine. Expanding on the notion of clinical or grand, grand rounds, narrative rounds aims to expand the ways in which we can conceptualize and draw on narrative or diverse modes of storytelling as a resource for engaging researchers and students, health practitioners, and the public in issues concerning health, healthcare, and medicine. This event was made possible by the support of the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry, the Student Development Fund through the Arts and Humanities um, Students Council, the Narrative Medicine Initiative and AMS Phoenix Project, the Department of Women's Studies and Feminist Research, Faculties of Health Sciences and Information and Media Studies, and Public Humanities at Western. I would like to especially thank Faisal Rahman and Lori Cameron who coordinate the Grand Rounds, uh, in the Department of Medicine at Schulich, and Shannon Art Falk and Sandra Bisman from the Narrative Medicine Initiative in AMS Phoenix. Thank you. Last but not least, I'd like to acknowledge the Director of Public Humanities, Joshua Lange, Marian uh, Golashani, and Dr. Ann Kinsella, who took on the work of initiating, organizing, and fundraising that were integral to making this lecture possible. So thank you very much. There is perhaps no one more fitting to kick off our interdisciplinary vision for narrative rounds than Dr. Arthur Press. Trained as a medical sociologist, Dr. Frank is currently Professor Emeritus at the University of Calgary, where he has taught since 1975. His impressive body of work has reached a large and diverse audience and readership, including those with chronic illness, healthcare providers, students in sociology, health sciences, and many other disciplines, I'm sure, and scholars of literary fields. He's published in journals that span a wide range of disciplines, including literature and medicine, qualitative health research, qualitative sociology, the Journal of Palliative Care, Journal of Pain and Symptom Management, Canadian Journal of Sociology, the Hastings Center Report of Theoretical Medicine, and I'm sure there's many more. He's the author of four books, A Memoir of Critical Illness, At the World of the Body, published in 1991, A Study of First-Person Illness Narratives, The New Storyteller, uh, published in 1995, a book on care as dialogue, the renewal of generosity, illness, medicine, and how to live, published in, in sorry in 2004, and most recently, a book on how stories affect our lives, letting stories breathe, a socio narratology, published in 2010. Among his many noteworthy accomplishments, the breadth and importance of his scholarly contributions to the fields of bioethics and sociology and others have been recognized by his 2008 receipt of the Adam and Lynch Medal for Bioethics, awarded by the Royal Society of Canada, and his 2016 receipt of a Lifetime Achievement Award um, awarded by the Canadian Bioethics Society. Dr. Frank's work on narrative reminds us of the power of storytelling as a way to understand human suffering and the human condition, and of the fundamental ways in which stories, the stories we tell about the illness experience, the stories we tell as patients, as healthcare providers, students, advocates, citizens, etc., and the stories that are culturally available to us at any given historical moment shape our identities and how we inhabit our bodies, the relations we establish with ourselves and others, and the futures we can imagine and who we are able to become within them. In August 2000, I was extremely fortunate to have met Dr. Frank, who was a keynote speaker at the Body Project's three conference in Saskatoon a gathering of scholars from many disciplines where I did my first conference presentation related to my doctoral research on genetic testing, a place where my own story as a critical interdisciplinary <coughs> health studies researcher began to unfold. I am just as thrilled today to introduce him as part of our interdisciplinary initiative on narrative health and medicine at Western. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Arthur Frank, whose talk is titled, Who's Narrative What Medicine? I so appreciate you coming out to this lecture, and I, I hadn't entirely taken in that I was the inaugural speaker uh, for this, this series, 
Uh, that's an awesome responsibility. Um, I, I think it's extraordinary that, that this university is undertaking this interdisciplinary project. Um, it's, it's particularly important to me because I, I think six years ago, uh, I spent a year working for Associated Medical Services in Toronto, which was setting up the Phoenix Project uh, in those days. And, and now to have that project well underway, and, and in fact to be a beneficiary of it myself, uh, sort of brings the circle around. Uh, but congratulations to you, and, and may this, this very difficult interdisciplinary undertaking um, thrive and, and uh, produce a great many more people who are doing this work. The stories that fascinate me most are those that plot the protagonist journey from a condition that I call narrative wreckage to his or her achievement of a livable coherence. This lecture will tell several such stories. The characters in these stories are both fictional and non-fictional, and I do not discriminate between them on that basis. I'll begin by letting us enjoy some time in the company of Pip, the hero of Charles Dickens' novel Great Expectations from 1861. Pip's story raises the first question posed in my title, whose narrative? I'll then turn to some characters in specifically illness narratives, and their stories respond to my second question, what medicine? In discussing these matters, as I will, I have an agenda in the field specifically known as literature and medicine, and more generally, as health humanities. My modest proposal is that those working in this field, including myself, might attend less to texts that are specifically about illness and medical work. And we might spend more time on stories that enlarge our sense of the existential dilemma of which illness is one of the most common instances, but only one instance. This is the dilemma that I do call narrative wreckage, a term from my earlier writing that I believe is worth holding on to. In Great Expectations, the first person narrator, Pip, grows up without the benefit of having a stable sense of where his life story began. We first see Pip as a small child, an orphan, in a graveyard, looking at his parents' tombstone. From the shapes of the letters that the young Pip cannot yet read, he seeks to decipher what his parents might have looked like. That's his childhood fantasy, that these letters may indicate their faces. The story that follows is about Pip struggling to form from whatever clues he has a coherent narrative that can guide his life. He will often get that story wrong to his misfortune. Pip is raised by his abusive older sister, Mrs. Joe, and her kindly blacksmith husband, Joe. Stability of self and of narrative are represented by Joe, and all that Joe uh, is is entailed in the notion of the forge. The forge in the book is both Pip's anticipated vocation and also his home. Mrs. Joe keeps that narrative unhappy, but it does have minimal stability. Then a wealthy recluse, Miss Haversham, invites Pip to her home for him to meet her adopted daughter, Estella. Estella makes fun of Pip's working class coarseness, which he himself had never noticed. Seeing himself in the mirror of Estella's gaze, Pip realizes he does not want to become the person whom he is tracked to become. The visit leaves Pip a narrative wreck 
That is, a person without any coherent life story that connects a reliably recalled past to an imagined future. In this wreckage, Pip becomes an everyman of modernity, caught between rural tradition and cosmopolitanism, between simple satisfactions of the forge and the imaginary desires that Estella aspires in him. Pip also becomes like a person recently diagnosed with what will be a long-term illness. His old life no longer plots a trajectory into his anticipated future. He knows he must become someone different from who he has been, but he lacks any guidance in becoming that person. Pip then mysteriously inherits the great expectations of the book's title, a seemingly unlimited amount of money. The terms of inheritance require Pip moving to London and becoming a gentleman, which is what he has desired ever since he met Estella, but what he is utterly unprepared for. Jaggers, the lawyer who administers Pip's inheritance, knows that he is shipwrecking the boy by transporting him to riches. Of course you'll go wrong somehow, Jaggers tells Pip during their first meeting in London. Because a condition of Pip's inheritance is that his benefactor remain unknown, Jaggers can only give Pip money. He cannot offer any narrative of why Pip has been chosen for this money or what he is supposed to become now that he has received it. Jaggers is thus a bit like a specialist physician who can make a brilliant diagnosis, who can offer effective treatment, but who is unable to help his or her patient reconstruct a life that has been derailed by illness. Confronting uncertainty not only about who his benefactor is, but more important, about what life, what the life he has been thrown into expects of him, Pip does find islands of stability. Uh, one of Dickens' most brilliant touches in the book is, is the, the faux castle um, that's home to Jagger's clerk Wemnick, who actually befriends Pip and takes him home. But for the most part, Pip does go wrong, exactly as Jagger's predicts, and is required by the kind of story of which Pip is a part. Shipwrecked on the shores of London, Pip needs some guidance. So he fabricates, he literally stitches together the best story he can, which is that Miss Haversham is his secret benefactor and her, her intention in giving him this money is that he will eventually marry Estella. <coughs> this story gives Pip bad guidance. Some stories give people bad guidance. That's important. This bad guidance is occasionally offset, though, by his better instincts. These instincts are exemplified by a moment when Pip secretly finances his friend Herbert in gaining a business partnership. But Pip cannot convert these ad hoc moments of spontaneous generosity into a coherent narrative that can guide his own future life. Estella, for her part, has always recognized that neither she nor Pip can control the story they are part of. She knows at least this. We have no choice, you and I, but to obey our instructions, she tells Pip. We are not free to follow our own devices. Estella thus expresses one of the great fears of the modern self, a fear that we can see in contemporary films like The Matrix and the Jason Bourne series. Pip's reaction to Estella specifies that fear and the existential response that's typical of modernity. His words could be spoken by a patient who again has just received a dire diagnosis 
of an invariably progressive disease. He says, her reverting to this tone as if our association were forced upon us and we were mere puppets gave me pain. Whatever her tone with me happened to be, I could put no trust in it and build no hope on it. And yet I went on against trust and against hope. Estella has it half right. She knows she is cast in the narrative that Miss Haversham has spun like a spider. But Estella still feels compelled to play the part that Miss Haversham has created her to play. The condition that Estella and Pip suffer together is nicely described by the Shakespeare actor and director Tina Packer, writing about Hamlet and Ophelia. They cannot help each other, Packer writes, so they fall into a form of madness and despair. Packer refers to Ophelia as a pawn in the middle of a power struggle between her lover and her father and the king. Fortunately, Estella is not Ophelia. She at least recognizes her part for what it is, and self-destructive as that part is, it will not lead her to suicide. Here, again, I find an analogy to illness. Both patient and healthcare worker are positioned in the middle of their respective power struggles. A question that is rarely asked is whether they can help each other. We speak endlessly about the healthcare provider helping the patient. I believe rather the need is for them to help each other. Lacking that help, each risks precisely what Tina Packer describes, a form of despair. Pip's turning point in the book comes in chapter 44 when he's learned who his actual benefactor is. It's Magwitch, who Pip met when he was a child, and Magwitch was an escaped convict. In another act of generosity, Pip gave him food. Magwitch is subsequently recaptured, transported to Australia, where he becomes extremely wealthy and decides to take on Pip. In another instance of narrative fallibility, Pip had supposed the instance with Magwitch was a moment in his past that had no role in his unfolding story. In this, he was wrong, as he so often is. Guided well, guided not well, excuse me, not at all well, but better by this revised narrative, Pip now is able to confront Miss Haversham in the presence of Estella. In a tone that the lawyer, Jaggers, might find promising, Pip cross-examines Miss Haversham on how she is supported and benefited from Pip's delusion that she was his benefactor. Given my interests in narrative therapy, I read the scene as a form of therapy session, with Pip playing both therapist and client. Miss Haversham becomes the embodiment of the narrative that has been giving Pip bad guidance. His therapy, his medicine, is to rid himself of that narrative. When I say that Miss Haversham embodies a narrative, I mean that in the technical sense that narrative therapists seek to externalize the problems of their clients. Conventional language and conventional psychological approaches treat people as having problems. The problem is situated within the client or the patient as a deficit or a pathology in the personality. And the person must change or be changed. Narrative therapy starts from a radically different point by insisting on talking about the problems as external, out there. It's not a question of changing the patient. It's a question of teaching the client strategies for dealing with an external problem. That's a paradigm shift. 
The problem is eventually given its own name and talked about in metaphors such as visiting the client as an unwanted guest. Problems are certainly affecting the client's life, there's no doubt about that, but they are not component parts of the client's self. That's the shift. An identity position outside of the problems is thus made possible for the client. Talking and thinking this way frees the client from being the subject of what narrative therapists very nicely call the problem-saturated story. This is the story that clients first bring to therapy of all the problems in their lives. The subject of the problem-saturated story is both the chief instigator of the problems, they're the ones who are doing all this stuff wrong, and the diagnostic object of therapy. Rejecting this subject position, narrative therapy invites the client to instead become a consultant who is expert on the problems that she or he has been living with, problems that are shared by other clients. Together, the therapist and the consultant devise ways to deal with the problem that's out there. That can mean exiling the problem entirely or perhaps allowing it to have certain limited visiting rights. But crucially, the problem is no longer in control of the client slash consultant's life. Pip, acting as his own therapist, can tell Miss Haversham that he is finished with acting as her narrative dictates. A pivotal question in narrative therapy, after the problem has been externalized, asks what kind of life the problem intends the client slash consultant to have, and whether or not that life can be considered a good life. That question is far more answerable, and it's less accusatory, when it's asked uh, rather than asking someone if you want to have a good life. Asking about the problem renders action more manageable in incremental steps. When Pip confronts Miss Haversham, the truth that he is speaking, both for himself and on behalf of Estella, is that the Miss Haversham narrative does not intend either of them to have good lives. Estella hears this but remains caught in the expectations of that narrative. She will persist in marrying the brutish Drumley, who eventually will conveniently be kicked in the head by a horse. <laughs> Pip, <laughs> hey, a lot of people got killed by horses in those days. I mean, this was, this was not wholly improbable. I mean, look at the accident rates. It was, uh, it was devastating. Um, Pip, for his part, can only be his own therapist so far. He cannot yet imagine, he cannot yet imagine how to put himself into a different story. And that's what this whole lecture is about, the imagination of putting yourself into a different story. Fortunately for Pip, events intervene. In the trajectory of the mythological narrative, the hero is required to undergo a descent in order to realize full selfhood. Pip's descent, on my reading, is the period between when Magwitch is captured and Magwitch's eventual death in prison. Pip's visits to Magwitch in prison, he visits him every day, seem to be the first time that Pip enacts a sustained and again embodied caring relationship with someone else. Pip kept secret his gifts to Herbert, acting at a distance. Magwitch most truly benefits Pip only after the money has been confiscated, when Magwitch gives Pip a possibility of turning the better instincts that Pip has always shown in an ad hoc way into what can be called a routine practice of caring. Pip shows up at the prison each day, 
and does what he can to ease Magwitch's suffering. After Magwitch's death, Pip descends a further level into sickness that may be near death. Time in the novel is suspended. Pip is in a sort of coma. And when it starts again, Pip is back where he started, with Joe now at the bedside caring for him. But this time, no Mrs. Joe interferes with that caring. She, too, has conveniently died in the interim. And now Pip is someone who himself has learned to care. Pip undergoes an initiatory rebirth with Joe as the maternal figure. Pip then proceeds to live his life. He goes to work. He pays the debts that he's incurred. And years later, when he encounters the now widowed Estella, he has, by painful accretion, set his life story within a narrative that does intend he and they together have a good life. The promise of Great Expectations' revised ending is that Estella and Pip have now learned enough to be able to help each other in ways that even the book's monumental friendships, and this is a great novel of friendship, Pip and Joe, Pip and Herbert, even these friendships cannot help. Estella and Pip's future together will always carry shadows of their past, but they are no longer pawns in an imposed story. The therapy is over. Pip and Estella can begin lives that are as close to being their own as anyone's life can. Great Expectations, even read this way, is not an allegory of illness. But Pip's story follows the narrative trajectory of most illness stories and of many stories about becoming a professional caregiver. Pip progresses from narrative wreckage in which, he thinks, in which what he thinks he knows fits no pattern that is useful in plotting a, a realizable future to narrative coherence. He fits a mythological narrative that in my early writing I called the quest narrative. I did that following the mythologist Joseph Campbell. Campbell emphasizes that in myth, the hero's quest can be called a road of trials. It involves perseverance through suffering. When I read Campbell, soon after my own treatment for cancer, on to 30 years ago now, I found his description of the road of trials the best evocation of suffering I could find anywhere. In asking the second question in my title, whose who's, who's medicine, excuse me, in asking the first question, um, whose who's narrative, I don't want to suggest that any of us can find a singularly, <laughs> a singularly authentic narrative that makes our experience cohesive and plots a reliable future for us. One of the great lessons that I took from serious illness is the truth of the old saying that when humans make plans, the gods are laughing. Individual stories are always being disrupted. And narrative trajectories are always having to be revised to incorporate those disruptions and their effects. Two resources seem crucial in encountering disruption. First, some people, most unlike the child Pip, have a narrative in place that is sufficiently durable to incorporate disruption without wreckage. They know where they came from, and that stands them in good stead. Second, some people are better able than Pip is to use the helpers whom they encounter. These helpers indicate how the work of narrative reconstruction might proceed. The second part of my title asks, what medicine? By medicine, of course, I, do, I mean a good deal more than a therapeutic pharmacological substance prescribed by a medical authority. I also want something altogether more positive than the ancient Greek meaning of pharmakos as a scapegoat who was sacrificed annually in a ceremony of communal purification. 
What I mean by medicine is what Pip actually needs when he gets to London and meets with Jaggers. As I said earlier, Pip needs a coherent story of how he got where he is. In what I think is the great lecture um, given by the literary critic Anatole Broyard in Medical Rounds at the University of Chicago, uh, when Broyard was in a sort of temporary remission while he was dying of, breast, of uh, prostate cancer, Broyard speaks about his need for a way to make cancer a coherent part of his story instead of a meaningless interruption in that story. Nobody wants an anonymous illness, Broyard told his audience. He continues, it would be more satisfying to me, it would allow me to feel that I owned my illness, if my urologist were to say, you know, you've worked this prostate of yours pretty hard. <laughs> it looks like a worn out baseball. I hasten to add, that while everyone, I think, wants a coherent narrative of life with illness, not everyone, not at all everyone, wants to own illness as Broyard does. In my own illness memoir, which was written at a time when there were still prevalent ideas about the so-called cancer personality, I asserted in opposition to that, that illness just happens. I recall a good friend of mine, Kevin Coleman, who lived for the better part of a decade with lymphoma before his eventual death. When Kevin read my memoir, he said the most valuable part for him was this affirmation that illness just happens. It need not be owned. What might account for this difference between Kevin's attitude and Anatole Broyard's? One difference is that Kevin had a cancer that allowed him long periods of remission, over a year sometimes, in which he was well enough to undertake work that was meaningful as a continuation of the life that he'd led before illness. With his small but sufficient disability pension, Kevin could engage full time in forms of political activism that he'd always wanted to do. He could tolerate and even embrace an anonymous illness, because for all that illness cost him in his realization that it would kill him sooner than later, it also enabled activities that he'd previously had little time for. Kevin's coherent story of how he got to where he was did not have to incorporate any etiology of his illness, and that in turn had much to do with the particular illness he had and what it allowed him to do. Now I need a third example that complicates and darkens what my earlier examples make appear to be too triumphant in this eventual achievement of what I've called a bit unquestioningly coherence. Among recent memoirs of trauma, illness, and disability, I found something that I heard is new in Christina Crosby's book, a body undone. Crosby is professor of women's studies at Wesleyan University. While she was cycling soon after her 50th birthday, a branch st stuck in the spokes of her front wheel, pitching her forward over the handlebars. She took the full impact of the fall on her chin, shattering her jaw and causing spinal damage that left her quadriplegic. As someone whose physical body was crucial to her sense of identity, Crosby has to reconstruct a viable life narrative. As I said, Crosby is a literary scholar, so she takes seriously the genre in which she tells the story of her disability. What she eventually decides, and this may distress some disability advocates, is that hers is properly known as a horror story. Crosby first offers an insightful analysis of the narrative arc of many disability narratives. Quote, 
Narratives of disability may be grim at some points, she says, but they almost always move toward a satisfying conclusion of lessons learned and life recalibrated to accommodate, even celebrate, a new way of being in the world. Crosby rejects that narrative as inadequate to telling her story. Profound neurological damage, she writes, actually feels to me more like a horror story, a literary genre governed not by rational exposition, but rather by affective intensification and bewilderment. She goes on to write that in horror stories, there's never a relief from the sense that something very bad is upon you. The result is generalized fear, a feeling that doesn't refer to anything real, but is in itself real. Crosby says a good deal more about her life as a horror story, but what I've read you is sufficient for my argument right now. One aspect of the medicine, or what we might call the therapeutic, sought by both Anatole Broyard and Kevin Coleman, is their desire to be cared for by people who recognize them in all their particular individuality. Crosby, whose medical condition is stable, expresses no particular interest in professional recognition. But she very much wants her readers to recognize the full horror of her situation. I want to propose that a common element in what medicine all three want is truth. Broyard wants and needs the truth that he has done just what Crosby describes many disability narratives doing. Broyard has, quote, recal this is a Crosby's gloss, recalibrated to accommodate, even celebrate, a new way of being in the world. Broyard's hyperbolic title, Intoxicated by My Illness, claims this new way of being. Broyard thus exemplifies what I called a quest narrative. When I first described the quest narrative in the early 1990s, I balanced it against the reality of what I called the chaos narrative. In lived chaos, there is no narrative trajectory except possibly downward. Crosby is on the edge of chaos when she describes her injury casting a very long shadow, the penumbra of which will only grow darker as the years pass and the deficits of age begin to diminish me still further. That's dark writing. But Crosby's narration is entirely too self-reflective to be a chaos story. Those who speak from a position of true chaos are too immersed in their story to be reflective about the genre in which they are speaking. Crosby may reject narratives that culminate in lessons learned, but her naming of horror as the genre appropriate to her life is itself a lesson learned. She's caught, necessarily, in that paradox. What is left to her includes the ability to write, albeit by dictation. In the signature phrase of the feminism that formed the academic and personal self-consciousness of the generation that I share with Crosby, she finds a voice. That voice is reflectively horror. The space of reflection that allows naming the genre is her medicine. The medicine I want to conclude with is the recommendation of truth. Everyone acclaims, well, nowadays, not actually everyone. I wrote this a while ago. It's amazing how the world changes in such short periods of time. Um, many people among us here today, here, acclaim truth. But how much truth anyone can tolerate is a question that I think particularly healthcare providers have to ask themselves. I recall another friend who eventually died of cancer, but years before she herself was sick, 
I happened to run into her in a shop. She had just returned from a support group she was a member of for parents of children with disabilities. And she was agitated to the edge of being angry. I had the good sense to just stand there and let her find the words she needed. And what she finally said was, we don't tell our own truth. I wish that she were still around to read Christina Crosby claiming horror as her appropriate genre. Truth to me is certainly perspectival and it is changeable over time. But truth is not relative in the sense that any truth will do just as well. At any moment from any perspective, there is a truth. Pip arrives at a truth when he confronts Miss Haversham, another truth when he cares for Magwitch, and when he reclaims his relationship with Joe, when he finally meets Estella as two people who can create a future together, they are finally able to tell the truth. Anatole Broyard and my friend Kevin Coleman each found and expressed the different truths of what they needed as narratives of illness. Christina Crosby writes a truth of her refusal of the quest narrative as adequate to expressing her life. She instead offers the stark truth that her life is a horror story. But Crosby does not end her memoir on the most modest variant of the note triumphant that she rejects in other narratives. Excuse me, she does end her memoir on a form of note triumphant. She describes the moment in her rehabilitation therapy when she became able, uh, using the eraser end of a pencil that she could barely hold on to, um, to turn pages of a book on a tray in front of her. I have my life back, she says, at that moment when she can finally turn pages for herself. We readers have already learned well how tentative and tenuous Crosby's victory will be, but we also know she has written the book. Crosby lives the narrative that she claims as her own. Thank you very much. Josh now gets the next. I'm going to really thank Josh. Well, Josh is jogging. Well, Josh. Easy, Josh. Easy. Well, Josh is jogging. Josh really, give, her, give Josh a round of applause. I hope you people all realize you, ne you never take your own people seriously. And, and, and Josh has just been so incredibly hardworking and, and just sheerly competent. And, and I work with a lot of organizers in different places, and you're, you're really lucky to have Josh, so thank you very much. Hi, my name's Greg. Uh, my name's Grant Campbell. I'm done uh, in the active information media settings. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, as you were, as you were uh, speaking, I found myself thinking of another Victorian novel, which is uh, The Mill on the Foss. Uh, by George Eliot, mm -hmm. and that line uh, that always sends chills up my spine, which is, Maggie's story is like an unmapped river. All we know is that there are plenty of twists and turns, and that for every river there's the same final home. Uh, I'm wondering if part of the uh, fascination with narrative is that stories end, uh, that there is, uh, and, and because they end, Thinking of, thinking of things in terms of narrative gives, uh, gives one the chance to craft closure of, of, of some sort. Is there, is, there, is there some way in which narrative uh, has a therapeutic effect by simply providing a, a, a finite conceptual shape 
hmm. right? One can one can see the trajectory and imagine the trajectory, and 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 write it in a way that uh, that, that has a satisfying closure. Oh, absolutely. Um, there's, there's been a lot of writing about the problem of ending a first-person illness narrative. Um, and Crosby deals explicitly with that problem. Um, it's, it's the problem of, of not wanting to, to turn this into some sort of positive thinking, overcoming narrative. Um, but at the same time, you know, nobody wants to, to have their story end in the ditch. And, and people are, are also writing for readers, and to some extent for publishers, and publishers are reluctant to bring out books that end in the ditch. Uh, unless you're a really famous person and people will be happy to see you end up in the ditch or something. Yeah, it's a different kind of problem. But, um, so ending an, Ill, an illness narrative is, is, is a very dodgy business. Uh, and it's fascinating reading them and, and seeing how different authors solve that, that problem. Um, sometimes it can just be a straightforward affirmation of, of ambivalence of feeling about this. Um, there are a number that, that are heroic. Um, others, like, like Crosby, repudiate the note triumphant, but then she can't resist ending that way. Albeit, you know, a, a, a very small note, a pianissimo kind of note triumphant. But, um, but definitely one reason we, we tell stories is that they, they make life manageable. You know? um, and, and, and by ending, even if, if you don't really have an ending, um, just by ending, you, you suggest that there's, there's, there's a manageable finitude to this. And, and yes, I think the other huge therapeutic value um, is a, a degree of analytic distance. Um, between what post-structuralist critics would call the speaking subject and the spoken subject. That, that you're able to, to get a little bit outside of this all too present body with all of its problems and, and, and see it from a bit of a distance. And reading Crosby, I, I almost had this, this sense of her kind of hovering above herself, looking down on herself. Um, and, and that too is, is to me, one of the most absolutely enduring benefits of, of doing this, this kind of writing. And, and, and it's a benefit that, that you can bring to anyone simply by inviting them to tell their story. Um, stories available to them. Uh, I, one of the things that I've really become quite convinced of is that our, our ability to tell stories depends crucially on the, on the stories we know, depends on our repertoire. That we, we, tell, we tell a story because we know other stories like that. Um, and one of the, the, the things I'll say that some people want to take a really sort of hard authenticity line we never really make up a story. We're magpies. We cut and paste. It's, it's what the great anthropologist Levi Strauss called bricolage. We, we gather bits and pieces, and we put them together for our own purposes. 
Uh, but they're all bits and pieces gathered from elsewhere. And, and I think what, what young people need are, are just all sorts of stories, uh, including the, the extraordinary wealth of folk tales, as in Brothers Grimm kind of stories, which are typically about children confronting impossible circumstances and finding resources for survival against all odds. Um, but I, I think it's, it's from, from those, what I, what I think of as bare bones stories, which folk tales are, um, that we develop a sense of narrative. Um, when I was, I was talking about Pip at another university, and, and a colleague pointed out the difference uh, between Pip and David Copperfield. Um, they, they share a great deal. They both get abandoned quite early in life. Uh, have to make their own way. Um, one of the, the differences, though, is that David Copperfield did know who his mother was, and he had a stable identity of his father, even though he died. And David Copperfield was left a shelf of books. This is an answer to your question. He was left a shelf of his father's books, which he read. And they were kind of cheesy adventure story books. But they gave him a narrative. And they gave him a sense of, of, of how, to, how to construct the narrative of his life. And, and they, they come back into the novel in, in various moments when, when he, he uses those stories as what I would call companions uh, in, in finding courses of action for himself. Um, the the uh, wonderful young adult author, Neil Gaiman, well, an author for everybody, um, so there, there really are no bad books for children to read. The only thing that's bad is not reading. You know, I mean, let, let people read the, the cheesiest, whatever, violent stuff. They, the important thing is learn to narrate. You know? and, and even really bad books will, in fact, sometimes bad books are particularly good for teaching you how to narrate. And, and that's the crucial point. So that, that would be. Sorry, he has the mic. I have no power. <laughs> Hi, my name is Manu Sharifi. I'm from the English department. And thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Uh, speaking of narratives and illness, I can't help but think of Daniel Paul Trevor. Uh, and his memoirs of my, my nervous illness uh, because it's, it's become such a popular text, especially for psychoanalysis and psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that, the questions arise as to whether or not a narrative is, or creating a narrative, is an attempt of reintegrating a diseased or you could say a deceased body into the body of the society to find or forge another identity, a new identity, to fit back into the society, the society mm. uh, to, to avoid being like a, a non-entity. Uh, mm. You know what I mean. Uh, I do know what you mean. On the other hand, uh, there's the question of exposing your own body mm. uh, to the gaze of narrative and in turn to the gaze of the reader, the mm. critic, the doctor, uh, and, so, and so forth. And uh, to add to that, uh, as you know, Angela Woods, uh, another critic, talks about uh, this imperative in today's world for coming up with a narrative to create an identity. To the extent that nar our narratives become synonymous uh, with our identity, which marginalizes other ways of being or expressing yourself. I just wanted to hear you about uh, that. Now, I'm not sure on that last point that it's especially modern. I mean, actually, I find Achilles talking very much that way back in, in, uh, in the Iliad when he has to make this fateful decision as to whether he, 
he goes home and lives for a long time and has a happy life, or whether he creates this, this story of, of himself as the heroic warrior at Troy. Um, so I, I can find that right from the get-go in, in Western literature. In terms of your main point, the illness narrative that exemplified that for me um, is that of Audre Lorde, writing back in 1980. And, um, and, and writing a very strong advocacy um, for, for the other level of visibility, uh, which is to society as a whole. Um, she was an, an early advocate of not wearing a breast prosthesis after mastectomy. And she then talks in the book about wanting to create lines of clothing and jewelry to, to accentuate and celebrate being asymmetrical. Uh, and for her, the, this, this affirmation of identity rather than the dominant reach to recovery, you can't tell that I ever you know, had a mastectomy. That was a crucial political gesture that was continuous with her feminism, with her African-Americanism, with her, her early advocate of what we, we would now call gay rights, although at that point the term hardly existed that way. Um, that that she, she, was, she was saying visibility is absolutely crucial. And the, the, the line that just really, was so, I, I can't say how affirmative it was for me when I read it in the early 90s, 10 years after she'd written the book, was when she writes, your silence will not protect you. I had seen so much silence in, in my own experiences of illness and the experiences of illness of people around me. And to have someone come right out and say, your silence will not protect you. And I, I think that's the, that, that's the linkage between the, the narratives of, as you said, nervous or mental illness and uh, diseases like cancer. jobs pay reasonably well if you've got them. Um, and, and an awful lot of patients aren't. So even before you get to national, ethnic, linguistic, cultural kind of, you, you just got a basic economic divide very often in medicine. Um, the, the, one of the most interesting reflections, I've, and, and any number of people have, have addressed this, I'm not a great fan of empathy. I really try to avoid the word empathy. Um, because despite recent work on mirror neurons and such, um, I, I think the most dangerous thing one human being can say to another is, I know how you feel. Or, it must be, whatever that is. Um, and you can get away with a line like that if it's said in a way that truly communicates caring. Um, but, but to me, it's, it's a presumptuous thing to say. Um, there's a, uh, a physician friend of mine in, in Rochester, New York, Ron Epstein, who just wrote a, a, a new book called Attending. Uh, Ron, for a number of years, has given workshops on mindfulness, primarily to physicians. And, and Attending is a sort of culmination of that work. And 
for him writing from a Buddhist tradition, uh, he differentiates between empathy and compassion. Um, empathy always has this risk that you actually do know what the other person feels. You know, empathy is, is taking, taking their feeling into yourself and feeling what it's like within you. Um, compassion does not require that. Compassion holds the other at some distance, um, but, but it, 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 it looks carefully at what the other has gone through. And I don't need to, I don't, I don't need to have an imagination of, of life in a refugee camp, I can't really, um, to, to, to see the enormous suffering and the impact of that suffering on the person before me. And so I, I can be compassionate um, in, in my ignorance. Um, and the good thing about that position of ignorance uh, is that ignorance can then turn into curiosity and I can ask the person to tell me. And really the most useful thing I can do is to say I have no idea what you've been through, um, but over the time that we have together, uh, in, in the scope of whatever our relationship is, um, I want you to try to tell me. Um, and, and then perhaps in, in telling me, bringing forth that story will begin to have some of the benefits of storytelling that we I talked about in res uh, response to the first question. Uh, so I, I think that differentiation of empathy and compassion uh, is, is one way of, of getting past this and, uh, and, and turning what, what can seem like a barrier into an advantage. Yeah, take the one furthest in the back, Josh. <laughs> Josh is also going to be captain of the crew team next term. Very exciting. Uh, thanks, Josh. Thank, thank you for the, for the talk. Um, so this is kind of up on the question you just answered about identifying with the storytelling, um, with which perhaps you don't have personal experience. Um, and I'm wondering if, in your experience, uh, in thinking about healthcare practice, uh, modern therapeutics, um, whether or not a spiritual or religious narrative represents a particular kind of challenge uh, and or opportunity uh, for, for assisting in patient cares, uh, the patient's ability to sort of express the meaning of their illness in resident terms for them that also contributes to the therapeutic outcome that a healthcare practitioner might be wanting to aim for. I mean, is there something different or challenging or unique about a, a patient whose self-understanding in terms of narrative and self-expression is fundamentally committed to what we might call um, a kind of unknowable and or even a rational uh, kind of uh, discourse of self-understanding, i.e. through religion? Um, I, um, I, I'm laughing because I... Now, my, uh, one, one of my current projects that I'm, I'm most involved in is a collaboration with the Alberta Pastoral Care Association. And I, I've, I've worked a lot over the years in clinical pastoral education. Um, I always think, though, to your, to your question of, of a case that's in a, in a wonderful book. That I don't know if enough of you read it. It's by David Barnard and colleagues, and it's called Crossing Over. And it's a fairly large book. Um, of, of rather detailed ethnographic case studies in palliative care um, based on observations of the Royal Vic in Montreal and the Hospice of um, Lancaster County in Pennsylvania. And one of these, these, again, very detailed ethnographic chapters is about a guy, I can't remember the pseudonym they give him, but he's been an alcoholic and led a really horrible life, done terrible things to people. And um, either just before or when he gets to hospice, he finds Jesus. And, and Jesus brings some really good things into his life. Jesus allows him to, to get sober for the first time in his life. And uh, there, there are definite benefits. But his version of Jesus is definitely what you'd call punitive. He has a, a highly punitive, self-punitive, other punitive. Uh, his, his God sits in judgment with a capital J, with a sword across his lap. 
And it's a very charming chapter because the, uh, the, the chaplain in this hospice is a, you know, like embracing new agey, Jesus is all about love, you know, come on, let's hug. And, and, and he's trying to talk this guy out of it. And it's a very interesting ethical issue that I think is, is, is exactly what you're raising. As, as one of the, I remember presenting this, this case at a, a meeting on religion and medicine decades ago now, and, and one of the, the, the chaplains in the room said, well, you know, dying with, without, without self-condemnation is, is one of our goals. And we, we kind of like it if, if people, people die without castigating themselves. And, and that's true enough, but, but to what extent do you, do you talk people out of something um, that, that has had unquestioned benefits in, in, in their lives. Um, I, I guess to me it's, it's really like any of the old court decisions on free anything. It, the, the, the line would be when that fellow starts inflicting his religion on others and telling them that they're going to be judged. Um, if it's just a matter of the judgment that he feels is coming on his life, well, that's, that's his way of working things out. And, and I, I would be inclined to, you know, let him, let him do that. Um, if, if he starts proselytizing around the rest of the hospice, one, one then has to draw a certain line at that. And I think that's, that can be a, a fairly generalizable principle. Um, if, if those beliefs are, are contained, if the individual maintains them themselves, I, and speaking that way, of course, I'm, I'm taking a classic enlightenment separation view, and I'm, I'm very well aware that when we're in the realm of serious conviction, the whole point of having those convictions is that you have them for everyone. You don't just believe they're true of you. You don't just maintain this is a, this is a an individual thing, and. Not, I think, as, as it's written up in Crossing Over, but as I could readily imagine it happening in real life, somebody like that is going to start spreading those ideas, and that would create a rather different kind of pro problem. And, and that's, that's fundamental to where you have a lot of people's stories meshing with, with other people's stories. So the more generalizable point you're, you're getting at, which could take us well into the afternoon, uh, is, is what happens when stories clash? And, and is there a point at which stories are truly incommensurable with each other? Um, and that's, that's really an open question to me, uh, how, how far that goes. Um, so you, you, you've given us a, uh, a wonderful ending as opening. Um, <laughs> For, for yet another another level of the discussion. Um, thanks to Professor Frank for offering such a remarkable beginning to narrative rounds. We do have a Facebook and Twitter page if you like the event today. We're going to be doing more into the future. Uh, it's a new initiative, and I'd like to uh, extend a welcome to all of us to give a warm thanks to Professor Frank for your talk.